Well, thanks for joining us today. Today I am going to talk about how to push your instruments past their specifications. And this is a, to a topic that I am always really excited about because I love playing with instrumentation and finding ways to put, push them to their limits and get the best results out of the instrumentation. First, I want to start out by defining water potential and going over a quick overview of what was discussed in Water Potential 101 and 201. And water potential is defined as the energy required per quantity of water to transport an infinitesimal quantity of water from the sample to a reference pool of pure free water. And an easier way to look at this is that it, in soils, water potential essentially is the energy required, for example, for a plant to pull water out of the soil. Um, and water potential has a lot of applications in soils. And it's an important tool and an important property to understand in soils. Uh, some important points about water potential. Uh, one, water potential is a differential property. So a reference must be specified. And in soils, we use uh, pure free water at the soil surface as a reference. And at this point, its water potential would be zero. Um, and as the soil dries, we then get, get, get negative values from that point. The water potential in, in, in the environment is almost always less than zero or a negative value when discussing this is in terms of water potential. Um, now, this would be different, for example, in saturated conditions or ponded conditions, but typically in the environment, this is almost always less than zero. Water in tissue or soil is very different from water in a glass. In soil, we're dealing with water bound to surfaces, diluted by solutes, under pressure or tension. Uh, it's a very different energy state from free water. And that really provides issues when trying to uh, measure water and understand water and so it, as it moves through soil and, and how it can be uptaken by plants. Some other important points. Uh, one thing to understand is there are several names for the same measurement. So typically when we talk about water potential we're talking in terms of negative units. Uh, other, te other terms that are used are water tension, soil suction, and soil pore water pressure. These are the same measure, but typically when we talk about these, it's actually the opposite value. So for example, if we're talking about a water potential at negative 33 kPa, if we were talking about this in terms of soil suction or water tension, it'd be positive 33 kPa. But we're essentially talking about the same thing. We just, uh, it's, it's displayed differently. Uh, and typically when we're talking about water t potential in soils, uh, we typically use units of pressure, for example, megapascals, kilopascals, meters of, of water, or bars. It can also be talked in an energy state, for example, joules per kilogram. Um, but typically, uh, most people use most likely kilopascals or, or, or bars. Those are some pretty common terms. Water potential is influenced mostly by these four things. Uh, one is the binding of water to a surface. So in this case, it's going to be a binding of water to the soil particles and other uh, particles such as organic matter within the soil. Um, also, uh, the position of water in a gravitational field. So for example, in this image that we have here of a soil profile, uh, if we were using the surface as our reference, uh, the deeper we go in the soil profile, we have a gravitational, gravitational potential that we would have to overcome. So for example, if we were down negative 70, 70 centimeters within the profile, we would have, have to overcome that uh, gravitational potential. Uh, it's also affected by solutes in water. So uh, salts, uh, salt increases affect the water potential. Um, and then the last thing uh, that we typically refer to as uh, the pressure on the water, so hydrostatic or pneumatic. Uh, this is typically going to be uh, when you have uh, ponded conditions uh, or, or saturated conditions where you actually have uh, a level of water above your reference point <clears throat> or above your point that you're measuring at. 
Now, when we talk about total water potential, it's essentially a sum of those four components that we just talked about. So we have psi t, which is our total water potential, uh, which, is a, which is a function of psi m, which is our matrix potential, which is those adsorption to the surfaces. Um, gravitational potential, which is, again, based on the position uh, relative in a gravitational field, so psi g. Uh, psi o is the osmotic potential. Uh, or it's the effect of solutes on the water potential. And then psi p, which is the pressure potential. And all of those uh, components combined make up the total water potential. Now, when we're trying to measure soil water potential, uh, as far as instrumentation-wise, we have three different categories of tools that we use for measuring water potential, uh, whether in the field or in the lab. Um, this first method is uh, solid equilibration methods. And within these methods, we have a few different tools. We have electrical resistance uh, methods, which involves a uh, granular matrix, where we are ins inserting that granular matrix into the soil. It comes into equilibrium with the soil, and we are measuring the electrical resistance of that uh, granular matrix. We have the capacitance method, where we essentially are ins inserting ceramic disks that we know the uh, moisture characteristic curve or the, the moisture properties uh, of, that, of that ceramic, allowing it to come into equilibrium and then measuring, using a, the capacitance method, measuring the water content of that ceramic and then outputting a water potential. And then last but not least, uh, thermal conductivity. Uh, method where we again install a ceramic cup or a ceramic uh, material into the soil, allow it to come into equilibrium, and we measure the thermal conductivity of this material and we're able to use, uh, use that measure to uh, determine water potential. And with all three of those methods, it involves putting some sort of material into the soil, allowing it to come into equilibrium with the soil and making some sort of measure of that material. We then have the liquid equilibration methods, which in this method, uh, we're mostly talking about tensiometers. And what tensiometers do is we insert, uh, for example, a ceramic disc or, uh, or, or ceramic cup, sorry, uh, into the soil. And the ceramic cup is either filled with water or it has a shaft filled with water. Uh, you can see a picture of that example here. And what we're doing is allowing it to come into equilibrium with the soil and we're measuring the pressure that as the soil pulls the water out of the, of the tensiometer, it's creating a, a suction and we're able to measure that with, for example, a pressure transducer. And that gives us a direct measure of, of the matrix potential. It does not give us measures of, of, the, of the other components, the osmotic potential, um, but it can also give us a measure of the pressure potential when we do have saturated conditions. And this is probably one of the most accurate methods. Uh, the problem with the liquid equilibration method is it's limited it within range. Typically, the uh, tensiometer, we can only measure down to negative 85 kilopascals, maybe 100 kilopascals, except for some special tensiometers. We're able to make, uh, use some, some special techniques to push the range of the tensiometers, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then last we have the vapor equilibration methods. And within the vapor equilibration methods, we have, for example, a thermocouple psychrometer or a dew point potentiometer. And with both of these instruments, essentially what we're doing is measuring the relative humidity and using that measure of relative humidity to determine uh, water potential. Another technique that's been uh, used for a very long time for measuring and creating uh, moisture characteristic curves is the pressure plate. The pressure plate was introduced in the 1930s by L.A. Richards. And essentially what we have here is a, an apparatus where we're install, inserting samples and using the pressure above the soil sample uh, with water uh, in a saturated sample, forcing it to come into equilibrium with the applied pressure. So for example, if we wanted to bring a sample to 10 kilopascals, we would apply a pressure of 10, kilo, uh, of, of 10 kPa and let that sample come into equilibrium. And 
typically uh, we have to deal with the equilibration times. For wet samples, when you're just trying to come to uh, anywhere within the 0 to 100 kPa, you're looking at usually uh, equilibration time of, of less than a day, um, sometimes a little bit longer. Now, when we're trying to get dry samples to come into equilibrium, anywhere between the 100 kPa and 1500 kPa, uh, this usually takes a week or longer. And there are a lot of publications out there saying that uh, these samples may never come into equilibrium using this technique. Um, an example of this is in a, a publication by Vitelli and Fleury from 2008. Um, and so that really gives us a problem when we're working in that range of 100 to 1000 kPa, trying to get develop moisture characteristic curves um, and, and get accurate measures, it, it really uh, creates issues and so uh, if we have to look at other methods for, for measuring the moisture characteristic curve. So just some important points on instrumentation. There really is no ideal water potential instrument to uh, measure uh, the across the full range of the moisture characteristic curve. There are many good choices for instruments. Um, really, it's going to what you have to think about there is, is what is your goal? What range are you trying to measure within? What accuracy do you need? And um, what is your, your price, price range as well? Um, but those are all things you need to think about when looking at instrumentation. And uh, really, these techniques must be combined to get a complete understanding over the entire range of the moisture characteristic curve. Some applications of soil water potential uh, include uh, when we use the soil moisture characteristic curve, it gives us a great understanding of what plant available water is there. Uh, it can also be used for to, uh, different, doing different measures such as uh, surface area of soil, uh, soil swelling potential. This is a common uh, tool used especially in the geotechnical industry where uh, swelling potential of soils can cause issues in road construction, home construction and, and other building construction. So that's a common application of using moisture characteristic curves. Um, and really water potential is a, is a key component in understanding uh, soil and plant water relations in the field. Um, uh, it really is the controlling factor in, in, in plant's availability to pull water um, and, and able to survive in different conditions. Um, Water flow and contamination transport studies are also a very uh, common application of water potential because again, just as with plants being able to pull on water, water flow through soil is, is predominantly controlled by matrix potential and some other factors such as hydraulic conductivity, but they all play a role in, 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 uh, in water flow through soil. And of course, in irrigation management, it's, it's, uh, so knowing soil water potential is so much more powerful than water content because, again, it gives us a better understanding of the plant's availability to pull on the water in the soil. So here's a brief outline of the rest of the presentation. Uh, we just did an overview of some of the topics discussed in water potential 101 and 201. We'll go into an introduction into the high prop method or the Wind Schindler evaporation method for measuring water potential, uh, an introduction into the WP4C, talk about some issues with hysteresis and sample density issues, uh, go over some special considerations when using the high prop, uh, how to expand the range with the high prop, uh, how to fine tune your WP4C skills, and then going into combining data from the two instruments to create the full moisture characteristic curve. So before I start talking about the instruments, I want to talk a little bit about what we used to call as this kind of no man's land of water potential instrumentation. So if you look on this chart here, you'll see we have this grayed out area uh, in between about 150 to 200 kPa and, and negative one megapascal. And in the past, we really used to, ha used to have issues uh, getting good measures uh, within this range uh, to really fully characterize what's going on in the soil. And, and in many instances, this is an important range uh, within the moisture characteristic curve. And, and so it was really imperative that we find a way to close that gap and, and, and find instrumentation that can 
uh, help us cover the full range of the moisture characteristic curve. And in the past, we, with the, some of the older techniques, even with the dew point technique, before some recent changes, we were not able to fill that gap and, and uh, get good measures within that range. But we've made some strides and, and have really been able to push our capabilities in, in making these measures. And we'll discuss that a little in further in detail as we go through these slides. So first, I want to talk about the winch and layer evaporation method. And Essentially what we have when, when using the winch and layer evaporation method, we have a device where we have two tensiometers at different points within the soil. And we are measuring the change in soil suction or the change in water potential as the soil sample uh, naturally dot dries at the surface. And what this gives us is, one, a measure of the change in water potential. It also gives us a, a, a change in unsaturated hydraulic conductivity. So we're able to not only do the moisture characteristic curve, but we're also able to do uh, an unsaturated hydraulic conductivity curve. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the math that goes into that here. So when running the high prop, uh, the high prop is set up with a saturated soil sample. So before uh, putting the sample on the high prop, we'll fill the tensiometers. And I'll go a little bit, talk a little bit about the filling process of a tensiometer. And then we'll take a saturated sample and uh, auger out two small holes for the tensiometers and put the sample on the high prop. We will then uh, set the high prop up on a scale and connect it to a computer. And we're logging over time the change in water potential at, with the, at the two different points within the sample and the change in weight uh, as the sample dries down. And this allows us to get the water content change um, and the change in water potential of the sample to help us uh, generate that moisture characteristic curve. Typically, this process takes about four to seven days, um, depending on the soil texture, uh, also depending on conditions within the room uh, at, at, that will control the rate of evaporation. So I'll just briefly go over into the, high, the calculations that the high prop does to measure um, the water potential and the uns and unsaturated hydraulic conductivity. And we won't focus too much on this. But essentially what we're doing is, again, at two different points within the sample, over time, we're measuring uh, the tensions at the two different points and the sample weight. And so what we're able to do is we're able to take the average water content or the change in water content and the medial water tensions and give a discrete value of the retention function at any time. Um, and that's a, it's a really amazing thing to be able to do because we're able to generate a lot of points across the moisture characteristic curve over time, very simply with, with little, little, uh, little work once this, the uh, apparatus is set up. And uh, just to reference some of the work where a lot of the work that goes into this technique came from. There's a good publication by uh, Uwe Schindler and, um, and L. Mueller from 2006 titled Simplifying the Evaporation Method for Quantifying Soil Hydraulic Properties. So if you want a good read on the um, evaporation method, that's a great publication to look into. So uh, some other calculations, we are also able to calculate the unsaturated hydraulic conductivity using the Darcy Buckingham's law. And essentially what we're doing, doing is using the mean hydraulic gradient or uh, the change in tension between the two different tensiometers along with a change in uh, water content. And by using those uh, combined factors, we're able to, to determine the unsaturated hydraulic conductivity um, throughout the drying process. Now, one limiting factor here is in wet conditions, when there's little difference between the bottom and the top tensiometer, we're not really able to, de to determine an unsaturated hydraulic conductivity. So uh, in some samples, especially very coarse samples, um, we can only generate a few points along the hydraulic conductivity, unsaturated hydraulic conductivity curve as the sample dries. Now, with the high prop uh, and with, with many techniques, there are assumptions that are made. Uh, one assumption is that there is quasi-steady state conditions, and essentially what that means is that uh, the evaporation rate over the soil sample remains fairly constant um, 
over the entire process. And so that's mostly going to go back to conditions within the room uh, staying constant. And that's an important factor, and we'll kind of discuss that a little bit more uh, when using the high prop. Um, another assumption that's made is uh, linear decreasing water content over the sample height within the measurement interval. And uh, there was a lot of work done, and this, a lot of that work is done in that paper that I just talked about, uh, to determine if this was really a valid assumption and if that really uh, worked well for this with technique. And, and uh, what they found is that it, it did work, and, and that's why the high prop was made the way it was made. Okay, now we'll go into the chilled mirror dew point technique. And uh, essentially what we're doing with the chilled mirror dew point technique, we're taking a, a, a mirror uh, t attached to a thermoelectric cooler and warming and cooling the mirror until we reach a, a dew point and measuring that, the formation of that dew with an optical sensor. And what that gives us, uh, by doing this with a sample that's coming to equilibrium within that chamber, we are able to determine the relative humidity of this sample. And uh, some other measures that are made, uh, the, so we use the mirror temperature uh, when the dew is forming, and we do this continuously until we find that we've, we've reached a steady state or an equilibrium uh, within the sample chamber. And we're also measuring the sample temperature with an infrared thermometer. And water potential is approximately linearly related to the sample temperature minus the uh, dew point temperature, or, or the, it's essentially the vapor deficit. And we're able to re relate relative humidity to water potential by using the Kelvin equation. Um, so by using uh, the relative humidity and uh, the water potential and using the Kelvin equation together, we're able to get a direct relationship of water potential. Um, now I bring this chart up to kind of talk about, uh, to show changes in relative humidity at different water potential points. So I think an important one to look at is look at the relative humidity at field capacity. We have a relative humidity of 0 0.9998 and a, then the relative humidity at permanent wilting point. We have a relative humidity of 0 0.989. That is a very small change in relative humidity. And so it, it requires an accurate measurement of, uh, of relative humidity to really get an accurate measure of, of uh, the water potential. And in the past, you know, we've been able to do a pretty good job of this, but we weren't really able to push ourselves up into that wet end um, until probably now we're able to push ourselves further up into the wet end. And I'll talk about that a little bit as I continue to talk about the WP4C. But I did want to show this because it shows that uh, when, um, with this technique, you, you really need an accurate measure to really get a, of, of relative humidity to get an accurate measurement of the water potential. So with the WP4C, um, typically we use the WP4C as the dry range instrument, whereas when you were using the high prop as the wet range instrument. And we'd use those two instruments together to get the full moisture characteristic curve. And with the WP4C, we're able to measure water potential with an accuracy of plus or minus 0.05 megapascals. And with this, we're having to resolve temperature differences of a thousandth of a degree. And that's a very, uh, you're looking at very small changes there, just like I, I talked about with the relative humidity changes. So with, I mean, with these improvements, in the past we were not able to measure that accurately with this technique, but now with latest improvements, um, we're really able to improve the technique and, and, and push ourselves up into the uh, neg negative 50 and negative, in between the negative 50 and negative 1000 kPa range, which really is powerful when trying to combine this instrument with another instrument like the W, with like the high prop. Okay, so now we're gonna go into uh, some hysteresis and sample density issues. Uh, talk about some considerations when using the high prop and how to expand the range with the high prop and fine tuning your WP4C skills. <laughs>
So, uh, you know, one thing that has to be understood, hysteresis is a well-known phenomenon in soil. And the definition of hysteresis is a uh, difference in the relationship between the water content of the soil and the corresponding water potential obtained under wetting and drying processes. And below is an example of that where we have a few different soil types uh, that we've generated uh, moisture characteristic curves using both the wetting and drying process. And this is a great example showing uh, the hysteresis uh, within that sample. And this is something that has to be considered when using any instrument and, and how you run the instrument to combine them together uh, to generate the full moisture characteristic curve. And I'll show you an, uh, a great example of this where we uh, use two different techniques with the two different instruments and it, and it created some, some pretty drastic differences in the moisture characteristic curve. Another thing that has to be considered is sample density. Um, prior to the upgrades made to the WP4C, where we uh, weren't quite able to get up and accurately measure up into the wet range, sample density was not much of an issue. And, um, but as we now try and push further up into the wet end, it becomes more critical. And below is a graph that kind of shows some of the, uh, or shows the different uh, adsorptive forces kind of across the uh, moisture characteristic curve. So as we're getting into the wet end, so the 100 kPa to, to so the saturated to 100 K, negative 100 kPa range, uh, we're dealing mostly with uh, capillary uh, forces and, and, and uh, the water being held by, by the capillary forces within the soil sample. And so in this case, uh, soil structure, uh, sample density are going to be very critical and, and, and uh, going to have a major effect on, um, water, on the water potential. But as we get drier and get more into the absorbed film range, we're dealing more with water absorbed just to the soil particles themselves. And there's been research uh, showing that in this range, um, sample density doesn't play, or, and, and structure doesn't play nearly as much of a, a role, and so, so we can get away with using disturbed samples uh, to get measure within this range. But as we're trying to push into the wet range, now we're dealing with sample density issues, and this has to be considered when uh, taking samples and trying to measure the moisture characteristic curve. So some considerations with the WP4C. Uh, first thing you want to think about, of course, is your sample collection. Um, you need to determine whether you want to take an intact sample or use a disturbed sample. Um, if you're not really concerned with, with pushing into the wet range or if you're using a, a disturbed sample throughout for generating your entire moisture characteristic curve, then it's okay to use uh, disturbed samples. But uh, if you're using intact samples and, it's, and you're trying to push into this wet range, you might want to consider taking intact samples for both instruments, for say, for example, an intact sample with the high prop and an intact sample uh, for the WP4C. And this is possible with the stainless steel sampling uh, sample cups. You can go out into the field, um, dig a small little trench or a small hole, and, and lightly tap the sampling rings into the soil and take out a small intact sample. Um, and this was something that we did for uh, some samples that we ran, and I'll show some of the results from that uh, later. Now, if you're going to use disturbed samples with the WP4C, what you want to do is you want to take a soil sample, uh, put it in a cup, and add a certain amount of water. And you want to do, use multiple samples and add different amounts of water to each sample to get different points along the moisture characteristic curve. But what you do is add the water to this sample, mix the sample, um, seal it, and let it stand for 24 hours, allowing it to come into equilibrium. And then you'll take that sample and do a subsample into your sampling ring and run that on the WP4C. So some other considerations. Um, Really, I always feel that the more samples, the better. Um, typically, when we're running moisture characteristic curves, we use anywhere from 10 to 15 samples. 
uh, at different water contents to generate the dry end with the WP4C. And uh, one thing that you really have to watch out for, especially if you're trying to push further up into the wet end with the instrument, is you need to run your measurements in a room with stable temperature conditions. Uh, temperature variations due to heating or cooling can cause uh, major issues when trying to measure in the wet range. So um, you really want to look out for that. And, and I'll show something that we use, it's, it's going to look very crude, but something that we use to, to help establish more stable conditions around the WP4C. Uh, when, when running your samples, uh, for dry samples, just say uh, drier than negative two megapascals, you'll want to run, you can, you can run the samples in precise mode or even fast mode for the very, very dry samples. And, and this will give you an accurate measure for, for that range. And as you get further into the wet end, uh, you're gonna want to run um, samples in continuous mode. Uh, and typically when you're doing this, it helps to have the WP4C connected to your computer. Uh, and you can use a uh, hyperterminal program, or you can also use the Aqualink software uh, to, to watch the changes in water potential. And what you'll do is you'll just run it in continuous mode and watch for stable measurements. And, and so you'll be looking at the outputs from the WP4C and look for a continuous output of the same uh, measure and the, of the same water potential value uh, within a, a small amount. And this will give you a uh, indicator that you've reached stable, uh, that you've reached equilibrium within the sample temperature and you have stable conditions in there or within the sample chamber. Now, uh, going back to that temperature stability uh, thing, um, if you are in a room that does have some minor flux, uh, fluxes in temperature due to air conditioner coming on and off or a heating unit coming on and off, one thing that does help, and, and, and it seems kind of crude, but it does work, is, is putting the WP4C in a box to help create a more stable boundary around the WP4C. And, and you can see an example of what we used in of what we've used in the lab, and uh, it's just a simple cardboard box where we have a piece of Velcro that allows us to open and, and close the box back up. Um, and this is a great way to help uh, create stabler conditions around the WP4C and allow you to push yourself uh, further up into the wet wet end wet end with the instrument. Now. Essentially what you'll do is you'll insert the sample, um, seal the chamber, uh, allow it to read. Typically when running in precise mode, you're looking at around five to 10 minutes uh, per sample for it to come to equilibrium. And as you get into the wet range and you're running it in continuous mode, you're looking at anywhere from 15 minutes up to maybe even 30 minutes on the very wet end to come into equilibrium. You'll then take that sample back out, dry it, or weigh it, um, dry it and weigh it again to get your water content uh, to correspond with that water potential point. Okay, now before we go on to talking about the high prop, I want to uh, go again and, and talk about that no man's land. And, and uh, one thing that's really helped with this, along with improving our, our capabilities with the WP4C, is um, the extended range that we're able to obtain with the high prop tensiometers. So, like I talked about before, a typical um, operating range for a tensiometer is, say, 0 to negative 100 kPa. After that, you start getting into uh, cavitation due to um, actual boiling of the water uh, under vacuum. And so, that was, that's a really limiting factor. And what we've been able to do is we've used a special ceramic and special tensiometers on the high prop that with, with proper use and, and good technique, we're able to push the tensiometers even further up into the uh, water potential range. Um, it's possible to push the tensiometers up to negative 250, and I've heard some instances, and this is not something I've been able to attain, but of pushing the tensiometers all the way down up to negative uh, 350 and 400 kPa, which is, is phenomenal. But, um, you know, we are able to push the tensiometers further than, than normal, which allows us to help close that gap uh, in the water potential um, range. And so this is something that we're able to do with the high prop to help close that gap. And so now to go into some considerations with the high prop. 
uh, one thing that's absolutely critical with the high prop is filling of your tensiometers. Uh, if you really want to maximize your capabilities with the high prop, you really want to focus on a good fill <coughs> uh, of, of the tensiometers to really push them up into the range. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about um, some things to consider there. Uh, as with the WP4C, again, you want stable conditions in the room because of the assumptions that are made in the calculations, that quasi-steady state uh, assumption. Uh, and so it's, it's always helpful to have a room with, with, with semi-stable uh, conditions. Um, it's not quite as critical as with the WP4C, but it's definitely critical. And so that's something you, you want to look out for. And another thing, because we're taking weight measurements, you want a stable platform for these weight measurements. You don't want a table that's going to be getting bumped into. Um, you don't want to have a weight room right next to your, uh, your lab, which was an issue that we've had before, where weights are getting dropped on the floor and actually causing the platform to shake and messing up your, your weight measurement. So uh, again, a stable platform for, for weight measurements is very important. <clears throat> Uh, so now let's, let's, let's go back and, and let's talk about that extended measuring range with these uh, tensiometers that allows us to push us a little bit further up. Um, there are three factors that influence the extended measuring range of a tensiometer. Uh, the first factor is the bubble point. Uh, if your tensiometer has a low bubble point, then you're going to get air in there anyways once you reach a certain, uh, certain uh, suction. But with the, ten with the temp tensiometers used on the high prop, they actually have a bubble point of 8.8 .8 bars. So that's really not a factor there. So we're able to push, uh, the bubble point is not gonna limit what we can do with the tensiometers. Uh, another uh, factor is going to be the vapor pressure or the boiling point of, the, of water. Typically, depending on elevation and, and, uh, and, and some other conditions, uh, your boiling point of water under suction is going to be at, at room condition, so at 20 degrees C, you will reach boiling point of water at 20 degrees, uh, or sorry, at 99.7, uh, I believe, 99.7 um, uh, kPa of suction uh, at sea level. And of course, this changes as you change in elevation. You do get a change in your your boiling point at room temperature under 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 vacuum, and so. The third factor is the ability to, uh, uh, for boiling retardation. Uh, what allows us to do this is um, uh, in order for the water to boil, it needs a nucleation site. And so the shafts on the tensiometer, on these tensiometers, the inner shafts on the tensiometer for the high prop um, have a, a smooth surface uh, in order to prevent uh, any possible nucleation sites for boiling. And so we'll go and talk a little bit further about that. Um, but and so in order to maintain that, we need to make sure the shafts stay clean. But here's an example of, of us being able to push the tensiometers further up into the measurement range. And so here's a, a actual uh, measurement with one of the high props where we were able to push uh, the top tensiometer up to about 1,900 hectopascals, so which is uh, 190 kilopascals, which is well beyond the typical measuring range of a tensiometer. And we were able to push the bottom tensiometer all the way up to almost 2,200 hectopascals, so almost 220 kilopascals, which is a great, uh, a great uh, area to reach, or something you want to try and reach with these high props. It is possible to push them. Uh, into this range and beyond that. So, uh, keys to a good fill. Uh, whether you're using the syringes or a vacuum system, it's important that uh, these three things below are considered. Uh, one, you want to have well degassed water. Uh, that's, if you don't have de well degassed water, you're not going to have a good measure. And the only thing that, that, that really helps with that is time. So it, you just have to take your time when degassing the water, uh, whether you're using the syringes or using the vacuum system. Um, and again, uh, a clean inner tensiometer shafts and clean high prop. Um, this 
really what controls this is, is how you finish up using the high prop. If you don't clean, clean the high prop properly before removing the tensiometer shafts, you run the risk of getting um, soil particles or, or dust or other things inside of your, your tensiometer shafts or inside of uh, uh, the high prop uh, sensor cavities. And this will provide a nucleation site and really uh, reduce your ability to pr push the tensiometers uh, further up into the range. And then, of course, last of not, but not at least, patience. Uh, with this instrument, it, the only thing that helps in getting a good fill is time and taking your time. <clears throat> and so you want to have patience when uh, filling the tensiometers, especially with the syringes. Uh, that, that takes more patience than, than any of the other, than using a vacuum system. But if you're patient with your, your fills and you take your time, uh, you can, even using the syringes, you can push your uh, tensiometers uh, well beyond the normal measuring range of a tensiometer. And so, uh, one thing I wanted to go into is using a vacuum system and some things you want to consider because uh, this is a question I get a lot. Um, one thing you especially need when using a vacuum is a leak-free system. So that goes into the type of line you use, the type of connectors you use, um, and, uh, and using kind of, uh, not high quality, but, but you don't want to use old line or old connectors because you run the risk of having a leak. Uh, one image you can see here is uh, to connect the tensiometer shafts to the vacuum line, I actually use a uh, silicon rubber that's slightly smaller, has a slightly smaller inner diameter than the tensiometer sh uh, shaft outer diameter. And this allows us to get a good seal around the tensiometer shafts and then the tensiometers would be placed in a beaker uh, with previously degassed water and then put under vacuum and the water is pulled in through the tensiometer shafts to fill the, t uh, through the outer parts of the tensiometer shafts to fill the inner part of the tensiometer. Um, another consideration is you do not want to use too powerful of a vacuum system. If you use too powerful of a vacuum system, you're going to blow out the tensiometers, uh, the pressure transducers, which is something you don't, you want to avoid. Um, so, Typically when we're looking at this, when you're putting the tensiometers uh, and, the, and the high prop system itself under vacuum, uh, you want it to take anywhere from 20 to 30 seconds, uh, maybe even up to 45 seconds, to reach the full vacuum of your system, which is going to be about 87 to 90 kPa, um, again, depending on your elevation. Uh, and what helps for protect, to protect the pressure transducers is a buffer bottle. Uh, we use a one liter buffer bottle. Uh, this helps protect the, vacu the pressure transducers, one, from the pulsing of the vacuum system because vacuum systems do pulse as they're uh, pulling a vacuum and if it has too strong of a pulse, it, uh, it can um, damage the pressure transducers. Uh, one thing that helps for uh, when setting, doing this setup is having an external pressure gauge. Um, this allows you to watch the pressure change uh, over time, and it also allows you to know when to come back and, and put the system under vacuum again as you're, you're, you're filling the tensiometers. Um, another thing that might be helpful is a desiccant chamber in line uh, to prevent damage to the pump. Because you're pulling uh, vacuum over water and, and, and pulling on this water and essentially pulling air out of the water, you're going to have air that's close to or not at a 100% relative humidity. And this, for some types of uh, vacuum systems, can damage them. So uh, you might want to consider having a desiccant chamber in line. Uh, another, when you're doing this, typically you want to put the system under vacuum for anywhere, and from anywhere to, from 12 to 24 hours to get a good fill. And so this, goes, again, goes back to that patience thing. So another great thing that allows us to even further extend the range of the tensiometers is we're able to use the air entry point of the ceramic to get another measurement point along the moisture characteristic curve. Uh, because what ha so what happens uh, when you're running a tensiometer, so you, you're running it through its normal range and then it cavitates. Uh, so, and typically when it cavitates with these tensiometers, it'll drop down to about 880, 860 hectopascals or, or 88 kilopascals. And then at, if you allow it to keep running, uh, eventually what's going to happen is you're going to reach the air entry point of the ceramic within the soil. And with these ceramic, it's about 8.8 .8 bars. Uh, 
And when that entry point is reached, you're going to see a, 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 a very fast drop from 880 uh, hectopascals all the way down to zero. And so we're able to use that point as that, that drop point as a reference to when the soil reached um, 880 uh, kilopascals or uh, 8.8 .8 bars. So, so that gives us another point on the moisture characteristic curve, uh, which is really useful when, when combining this with instruments like the WP4C. So um, there is a publication on this, uh, and uh, it's by it's. Uh, oh, I seem to have lost it. Uh, it's another one by Uwe Schindler. Um, it's titled. Uh, I can't think of it. Uh, it's it's. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it uh, pertains to pushing uh, the. I think I have it actually one of the next slides. So. We'll look for that. Um, but now we'll talk a little bit about combining data from the two instruments. Oh, sorry. Uh, actually, this is out of place. Um, we'll talk, now we're gonna, oh yeah, okay. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about combining data from the two instruments. Um, when creating the full moisture characters curve, it used to be a little bit more of a pain when you're trying to model uh, and, and generate fits to, uh, to data from two, instrument, two different instruments. But with the high prop fit software, we're able to combine data from the two instruments um, fairly easy with the high prop fit uh, software. And you can kind of see a screenshot of that below here. Um, this allows for fitting uh, different curve models uh, to a data set. So for example, you wanted to combine, uh, you wanted to generate a, a fit using the Van Genuchten uh, equation or the Van Genuchten bimodal or Briggs and Corey or uh, whatever uh, model you'd like to use to f and fit that to your data, you can easily add uh, data from a variety of instruments, whether it be the WP4C or pressure plate or, or uh, thermal couple psychrometer or whatever it is that you might use. Um, you're able to combine data from the high prop to the WP4C within this uh, within the same data set and generate the fits using the uh, high prop fit software. And so really quick, I want to show an example of, of some soil samples that we've run using the, uh, the uh, high prop and the WP4C. Uh, the three samples I'm going to show you are, uh, one is a, a Kiona very fine sandy loam. Um, it's about 64.4% sand, 10% clay, and 25.6% uh, silt. And this is uh, data based on uh, NRCS soil survey. Um, uh, the second sample was a uh, Shawana loamy fine sand, 79.4% uh, sand, so very high in sand, uh, low clay content, and, and, uh, and pretty low silt content too. And then uh, the last sample we want to, I'm going to show you is a Palouse silt loam. Uh, those values are out of place. I think it's about 21% sand, 67.7% uh, uh, silt, and 21% uh, clay. Yeah, so that's a, uh, not sure what happened there. But here's uh, that Shawana Lomi Fine Sand. And what we're looking at here is uh, the triangular data points are data points generated by the high prop. And uh, you're looking at uh, water content on the y-axis, uh, volumetric water content, and water potential in kilopascals, or negative kilopascals, uh, on the x-axis. And then on our, with our, we have uh, square data points generated by the WP4C. And you can see we were able to push the WP4C all the way up into the uh, into the almost field capacity point of this sample and matching that up with the uh, with the high prop and this was it allowed us to generate a very nice moisture characteristic curve um, and generate a nice fit to that moisture characteristic curve using the Van Genuchten uh, bimodal equation. So now our next soil sample is a Kiona fine sandy loam. Uh, 
And uh, on this uh, sample, we, we're going back to the issues with hysteresis. And so with the high prop, we're using uh, drying technique. And for this sample, with the, when we were running it on the WP4C, we used a wetting technique where we added, so we're slowly adding uh, water to the different samples. And what that caused was us to have a little bit of a, uh, a miss when measuring in, in between the about uh, 100 kPa and, 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 and 1,000 kPa. And so uh, this, this shows that issue that we run into with, uh, with, with uh, hysteresis. And so that's something that you have to consider. And so one thing that you can do to counteract this is use, instead of a wetting technique with the, high prop, with the WP4C samples, you can use a drying technique where you fully wet a sam the samples and dry them down uh, at different rates for the different samples and then let them come into equilibrium and measure those uh, on the WP4C. And the next example is an example where we did that. So this is a Palouse silt loam. And uh, with the Palouse silt loam, we were able to push the samples all the way up into the uh, wet end uh, wet and match them up with the high prop. And you'll see a little bit of a, of a uh, of discrepancy between uh, the high prop and the WP4C, and that's mostly due to the fact that we're, that's in the, in the zero to negative 100 kPa range, where the WP4C is not always going to be 100% accurate. But another, this, within the sample, we also used intact samples that you saw from some of the images earlier. Um, that we, we use those intact samples to take our, uh, our to, to run on the, in the WP4C and, and make those uh, measurements using uh, a drying technique. So we sat, saturated all of the samples and, and then let them uh, dry down and dried them down at different rates. So this is one uh, uh, sample showing uh, what you can do with these uh, two instruments together. So in summary, um, there are many tools available when you're wanting to measure water potential in soils, and you have to consider what your goals are, what range are you working in, what are you wanting to, um, what, 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 what are you trying to measure, how are you wanting to do this, uh, are you in the lab or in the field, uh, and, and again, what's your price range. Uh, the high prop and the WP4C are a good option uh, when trying to measure and generate the full moisture characteristic curve uh, in in the lab. But with any, as with, but of course with these two instruments, it does require some 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 skill and technique and some practice. It just it takes t a little bit of time to get good at using these two instruments together. But it can be done, and and uh, and you can generate some really nice data using them. And as with any tool for measuring soil water potential, again, there's a bit of skill required to use the instrumentation to its full, full potential. Uh, and, you know, for further conversation on this topic, please visit the, the soil water potential section of our forums and, and leave some discussion points. And, and we'd love to, to, to chat about this and, and, and see what you guys are doing out there. And, and uh, see if we can learn from you or if you, if you can learn from us. So uh, we always love to discuss th these, these things. So please visit our forum section and, and leave some questions or some topics and, and we'll, we'll f go further into them. Uh, so now we'll go on into questions.